Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, Angel Island Immigration Station, The Hidden History. This webinar is presented as a joint collaboration between the Stanford Program on International and Cross-Cultural Education, or SPICE, and the Center for East Asian Studies at Stanford University. My name is Naomi Funahashi, and I manage teacher professional development initiatives at SPICE, and I'm also an online instructional designer. Uh, just a little bit about SPICE before we begin. Um, SPICE serves as a bridge between Stanford University and K-12 schools and community colleges by developing multidisciplinary curricular materials on international topics and other um, areas of interest uh, for K-12 educators. And we conduct teacher professional development seminars, uh, and we also teach distance learning courses to high school students directly. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to uh, really thank our colleagues at CEASE for their support of this webinar. In particular, Professor uh, Daphne Zur, who is the director of CEASE, and John Groschwitz, who is their associate director. Uh, we are truly so fortunate to have such wonderful partners across the university. Uh, we greatly appreciate you joining us on Zoom uh, during these challenging times, uh, especially as schools are kicking off the academic year largely with distance learning, of course. Um, so we are keenly aware of the extended time that educators in particular are, uh, are having to spend on Zoom these days. Uh, I would like to go ahead and point our direction, if I can, to uh, some of the poll results. Um, thank you all for joining and participating in that poll as you signed in today. Uh, let's see, ah, okay. So just out of curiosity, we wanted to know uh, how familiar the attendees today are with the history of an Angel Island Immigration Station. Um, so some are somewhat familiar. I'd say the majority of people have at least heard about it or are somewhat familiar, and some people are not familiar at all. Um, so that's good. We'll be covering a lot of information for you today um, about, let's see, more than half have visited Angel Island, which is great. Um, means we have a lot of uh, Bay Area participants today, I think. Um, and then also we wanted to know what grade levels you teach. Um, there are quite a few who are not teachers, um, but we thank you for joining us. And we have quite a few students with us as well. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we hope that you enjoy the session with us as we talk about um, the history of Angel Island and why we felt that it was important for us to focus on this topic today. Um, today's uh, webinar is a very important and meaningful one for SPICE. Um, one of our primary goals since SPICE's inception in 1976 has really been to highlight and raise up the stories and narratives of lesser known voices in our society, especially for the K-12 audience. Um, we really want to make sure that the content and perspectives are out there and available um, for people to understand some of the experiences that may not be as commonly known. Um, so we're here today to really listen and to learn about the history of Angel Island and the significance that it holds within the broader narrative of U.S. history and immigration, and perhaps also in contrast to the more visible experiences in the U.S. Uh, sort of master narrative of history of European immigrants arriving at uh, Ellis Island, welcomed by the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast. So I'm really thrilled that we have the opportunity today to hear and learn from one of the founding members of the Citizens Committee that saved the Angel Island Immigration uh, Barracks for Historical Preservation, uh, Connie Young Yu. Um, before we jump into our presentations today, I want to just briefly introduce each of our speakers and tell you a little bit about the structure of today's webinar, and then we will go ahead and, uh, and introduce our first speaker. Uh, so we are joined today by Connie Young Yu, who is a writer, activist, and historian who has extensively researched and written on Chinese American history. And we are also joined today by Jonas Edman, my colleague at SPICE, who is an instructional, instructional designer. And he's going to be sharing the graphic novel and accompanying teacher's guide that SPICE developed on Angel Island to help bring this history to life for students. Um, and so we're going to first hear from Connie Young Yu. She's going to be telling us about uh, the history of Angel Island a little bit, and also through um, the narrative and through the story of someone that is very close to her and her family. Um, and I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that um, once she has a chance to speak. Um, so we will hear from her, and then we will hear from Jonas 
Um, and I should mention also that one of the things that we really focus on at SPICE is making sure that once teachers have the content in hand, that we also try to offer uh, sort of guidance in terms of uh, pedagogical um, strategy for teachers to be able to take that content to their students in ways that really actively engage students in that history. Um, so Jonas is going to be bringing that to life for us today. And then we will have some time at the end for Q&A. Okay, um, so without any further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker today, Connie Young Yu. She is the author of the book, Chinatown San Jose USA, co-editor of the book, Voices from the Railroad, Stories by Descendants of Chinese Railroad Workers. And she has written for multiple exhibits and documentary films on Asian Americans. She was the featured commencement speaker at the 150th anniversary celebration of the US Transcontinental Railroad, an event known as Golden Spike 150, which was held in May 2019 in Promontory, Utah. She was also, as I mentioned, on the Citizens Committee, um, the Angel Island Immigration Station Historical Advisory Committee that saved the Angel Island immigration barracks for historical preservation and was a founding member of Asian Americans for Community Involvement. She is board member emeritus of the Chinese Historical Society of America, historian for the Chinese Historical and Cultural Project, and an advisor to Hidden Histories, the Augmented Reality Art Project of the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. Today, she will be discussing the ramifications of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and how the tenets of the law were applied at Angel, at Angel Island Immigration Station. She will recount the experience of her grandmother, Mrs. Li yok Sui, who was detained in the barracks for 15 and a half months in 1924 to 1925, and also how the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals determined her case. Without any further ado, um, Connie, take it away. Hi, hello. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, I am delighted to, to be on the program. Uh, thank you all of you at SPICE for having me and I'm uh, thrilled to share the, a hidden history and also to be on the program with Jonas, Jonas uh, Edmund who will present this dynamic uh, graphic novel on Angel Island. So I have known about Angel Island perhaps all my life because I knew about the Chinese exclusion law from my parents. I think that even though they were born in the United States and my mother's father was born in the United States, there's always the feeling that we were perpetual aliens, even though we participated in every way. Um, and it was because of the Chinese exclusion law. And my mother would look at, out at San Francisco Bay, because we lived in San Francisco, and she'd see this big island. She'd go, oh, Angel Island. Oh, that's oh, so much heartache, so much dread. And that's how she felt about it. And it, because my grandmother, her mother, was detained on Angel Island for 15 and a half months between 1924 and 1925 because of the Chinese exclusion law, but also because of the technicalities of the law, even though she had legitimate papers, she had entered the United States being the wife of a US citizen. But the thing is, she was a widow. And in those days, a widow had no status. And when she arrived, they said, oh, where's your husband? You have no status. You, um, you know, your papers, you know, they look in order, but uh, I think that you will have to go to Angel Island, you know. So she was taken off the ship and put on a, a small boat, sent to Angel Island, separated from her six children. And it took uh, 15 and a half months of detention and the, uh, a court case, several court cases, and the final court case was determined by the U.S. Uh, Ninth Circuit District Court of Appeals and ruled in her favor. But ever after the scars of this detention, the scars of the, the, the ordeal remained for our whole family. So um, we did not think about Angel Island with any, um, any pride or 
or any uh, sense of history. This, in the 70s, when I started becoming an activist and involved with a, uh, a newspaper in San Francisco, an Asian American paper called the San Francisco Journal, you know, I became very interested, of course, in the exclusion law and, um, you know, how it affected our, our community. And a, a young activist, Christopher Chow, who was a journalist, he came up to me and, and showed me a stack of photographs. And this is in 1973. And they were photographs that I'd never seen before. And they showed the barracks and they showed um, an island, they show a wharf and, you know, they're very dramatic pictures, but they were very uh, depressing. And he said, these photographs were taken by Ma Matt Takahashi, a friend of Georgia Rockies, a professor at San Francisco State. There was a ranger on Angel Island, newly assigned to Angel Island in 1970, who went through the, this old building that he was told would be torn down. With his flashlight, he saw the writing on the wall. And he didn't know if it was Chinese or Japanese. He just knew it was significant. So he went to his superiors and he said, they said to him, forget about it. That building's going to be demolished. You know, that's just scratching on the walls. But of course, he wasn't, he wasn't going for that answer. He was taking a course of, from Georgia Rocky in biology. And George said, you know, I remember my grandmother telling me the first steps in America or on the wharf at Angel Island. And that, that did it. So Alexander Weiss arranged for George and his friend, Mac Takahashi and George's family to go to Angel Island and photograph every inch of writing that was in the barracks that they could see. And that's how the photographs came about. And uh, the rest, is history because that's how I became involved. We formed a, a citizens committee. Uh, Christopher Chow said, you know, we have to go through the system. We're not gonna just be our usual, you know, protesting cells. We have to go through the system, which meant we had to, to talk to John Ferran, who was the state senator, senator for this district that Angel Island was in. And Senator Ferran was, very, very interested and very um, concerned and drafted a resolution which passed the, the state Senate and it, they didn't even know what to call it. It was called the China Cove uh, resolution, which established our committee, which stopped the, the barracks from de being demolished because we were going to, to issue a report to the, uh, the state about the significance. So our report was accepted and we had our first big event that brought back former detainees the people who said oh why would you want to re remember this place just you know let it go it's it's a place of shame and humiliation and, and misery for us but when they found out that we were really you know going to bring out this history and talk about its significance and that they were going to be recognized that people who survived well, 300 people registered <laughs> and, uh, you know, joined our, our pilgrimage to Angel Island for this great event. And I'd like to just show you a picture that we took of at that event. Okay, so the date is April 28th, 1979. And here is a monument the, the, the monument to the Angel Island Immigration Station in homage to the immigrants who, who passed through here and who were detained. You will not see this monument if you go there now. You will see a very large, very impressive, very great plaza with the, um, this very imposing and you will see the barracks. But this monument has been removed and placed very high on the bluff, and I hope you will go take a hike and go look at it. It's, uh, it has great significance for us because our committee, uh, we had a, 
um, a community contest asking, you know, in the Chinese newspapers, people, you know, could you submit a couplet that will go on this sculpture that was donated by, by Victor Bergeron of Trader Vic's? And um, there were many entries, and this was the, in, the winning entry that was written by a former detainee. And it says, leaving their homes and villages, they crossed the ocean only to endure confinement in these barracks, conquering frontiers and barriers. They pioneered a new life by the Golden Gate. So that's the inscription. And you see on the right is the gentleman in a suit. That's our Senator John Ferran, who really facilitated this movement and uh, made this possible. And uh, of course, the monument was donated by Victor Bergeron. And we're about to have a, a lion dance. You see the lion dancers there ready. And standing in between two lion dancers is Paul Chow, who headed this, um, our committee that was started by Christopher Chow. This is um, Paul Chow, no relation. Uh, he's a Caltrans engineer, and he, his father was detained here, and so he had a great sense of um, feeling and obligation for getting this history right. He led so many tours before official tours were allowed. These were private tours that he'd take a group of, you know, community people or students and, and tell them the history, because we weren't really sure how this was going to, to be open to the public. But of course, after this ceremony, it was. Um, so, um, I would like to show you the slide of the person who made it all happen. This is Ranger Alexander Weiss, and I took this picture um, several years after that dedication. So, when he told me about his experience, I thought that it was no accident that he would be the one who would, who would, um, who would bring this story to light. He was newly assigned to Angel Island in 1970. And when he saw the writing on the wall, it just, it seemed to speak to him. He just knew there was something that was very important. And of course, he knew who to, to talk to about it, an Asian American professor at San Francisco State. And then he knew how to, um, you know, to, to, to say, you know, I will, help you get to the island and look at this. Um, he was a, a civil rights activist himself and um, he was a freedom writer. He came to the United States at the age of four from Austria, fleeing Nazi, Nazi Austria. And uh, all his life he said he felt dedicated to, to doing the right thing, to bringing forth this history. And you know what he said, he said, um, you know, this exclusion law was repealed in 19, uh, 1943, but he said in a minute it could be reenacted again. Kind of scary thought. But anyway, uh, we're very grateful, and here he is accepting. And he was, you know, we really wanted to make sure that everybody knew who, who he was and what he had done. And so um, he received a, a commendation from. Um, the state of California, and there he is. And the ceremony took place at, you know, at the site, there he is in front of the monument. And this is a ceremony of commemorating the 100th anniversary of the exclusion law. This was 18, well, 1982, and he's receiving the certificate from assemblyman, Art Agnos, who later became uh, a great mayor of San Francisco. Okay. We'll see another slide next. Uh, here he is. Oh, here is Harry Lowe. Now, he's wearing this T-shirt, which you know says Exclusion Act Commemoration, 1882, 1982, Angel Island. And Harry Lowe was the first uh, municipal. Asian American municipal judge in San Francisco. And at this moment, he had been appointed, or he was appointed to 
the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, a judge of the Ninth Circuit of Court of Appeals. And I thought that was so appropriate. And here's Art Agnos, and I'm talking to him because we're trying to figure out the lineup of speeches. The keynote speaker was Harry Lowe, who spoke about the significance of the exclusion law. And again, the message, never again. Next. Oh yes, again at the ceremony. Um, I'm in between two great historians. There's Philip Choi on the right, who actually organizes this commemoration on Angel Island. And he was on the committee too. And then on the other side, that's, that's Mark Lai, the grand historian of the Chinese Historical Society. Now, the man in front of Phil wearing a hat is Harry Bridges. And what is he doing at this commemoration? Well, he was detained on Angel Island. His, his trial for, you know, for deportation was held on Angel Island in 1939. The charges were that he was, uh, he instigated uh, a communist uprising by organizing a general strike in San Francisco that shut down the city in 1935. And he established the Longshoremen um, Union. Here he is, and sitting next to him, you can't see her, uh, but in the other picture she was, uh, that's his wife, Noriko Sawada Bridges. And when they got married, in the 50s, 1955, they, they tried to get married in Reno, Nevada, and they were refused a license because um, the, the clerk said, you know, we don't allow, in the, our state, we don't allow um, just white people with colored people. So <laughs> they went, uh, they called different authorities, they called the lawyer, and they finally, you know, were able to get married and by their action, by Naomi's activism, the miscegenation law in Nevada was repealed. So this was something to celebrate on Angel Island. Next. So I mentioned that uh, Paul Chow had um, taken people on tours before it was officially opened, before the ceremony in 79. And he had taken just, oh, well, maybe 100 tours of, of small groups um, he'd take them through the barracks. And on one of the tours, somebody noticed, you know, um, stuffed on the bottom at the edge of, you know, the, the pole, you know, the pole that was inserted into the wood. There's something stuffed, stuffed there and he pulled it out and they opened it and it turned out to be this piece of paper with a station, stationery that says Chinese Liberty Association, Angel Island, San Francisco, California unfinished letter goes to my honorable father. Here I am, you know, in this situation. Um, and it was very apologetic and it was not completed. But what it shows is there was, the Chinese were not taking, you know, their detention without protest. They were, they formed an organization with letterhead stationery. And this was in the twenties, you know, to, to, um, to write letters, well, write letters home, but also to um, officials and to friends and to like, you know, do what you can to get us out. Next. So, of course, there was the Chinese, there was a lot of this, uh, you know, I guess you would call it, uh, well, actually, this is a coaching book, and it was a legitimate coaching book. It's not a cheat sheet, because there are a lot of immigrants who did come on false papers and because and circumventing an unjust law. And they would uh, assume identities of relatives or friends that, that had, um, uh, you know, connections, and they would try to come in, and they'd have to memorize the same you know, testimony that would be given by their witness. Now, this is a, a coaching book that is legitimate of my uncle, and his brother would have the same coaching book, and they'd have to memorize it, and they, these would be the questions and answers, as you'll see in the next page. Yeah, there they are, the question and answers in Chinese, because there were interpreters. You know, of course, the immigrants, most of them were did not speak English, and they, they were always, um, they were all Cantonese interpreters. And so um, there's a question, answers, 
And the, it began with, of course, what village are you from? And then descriptions of, of the village and names of relatives. And one key question was about your mother or your wife, you know, whoever the female was. Did she have small feet, bound feet, or natural feet? And that was a, kind of a, a key question because um, my grandmother, my poor popo, she had bound feet. And we'd always look at her, her feet and see how she'd walk singly through, uh, through Chinatown and think of it, the, the pain it was. I mean, uh, anyway, that was, a, that was another thing about the women. They really did suffer. Um, so, you know, back to her story, this is a, a ship that's like the ship she came on through the Golden Gate and, um, of course, before the bridge. And it, it, her, she came on the President Cleveland. And my mother remembers, she said, when we came through the Golden Gate, and her sisters just jumped up for joy. We're home, home we're home, because they had been gone for so long. And they had been mourning their father, who had died only a year and a few months uh, before. And the mother was taking them home the, to San Francisco. All right. So my poor grandmother, this is, this is the welcome that she received from these officials. And uh, they, they were the ones who said, looked at her papers and said, you know, you are without your husband, you know, you will have to go to, before the board of inquiry to see if your papers are in order, you know. And, uh, and what happened was when she went, the, before she went to the board of inquiry, she had to go through medical examination. And it was found that she had liver fluke. Uh, filariasis, which was considered a terrible ailment, and anybody with that should be deported immediately. But after an appeal on that, she was um, a Stanford doctor, and they had connections because her her husband worked for uh, was an agent for the Haas brothers and Levi Strauss, going back and forth to China, and so um, they were able to contact the sisters. My mother's sisters, who are older, were able to contact the lawyer and who got a hold of a doctor at Stanford who, you know, treated my grandmother and she was cured. But the court then said, you know, she went to appeal again. They said, the rule here says that um, a woman, a widow, does, loses the status that was given to her by her husband, which is the wife of a citizen, wife of a merchant. So again, there was a telegram that said deport her, deport Wang Shi, that was the name they gave her. So uh, again, that's why the last appeal, appeal went to the, um, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Next, okay. This is a picture of my grandmother. Uh, this is a passport picture, an early passport picture when she went back to China with her children when her husband had business there. And uh, this is a letter that was signed by Charles Fricker, Fickard. He was a very prominent lawyer. He was a lawyer for the, Stra for the Haas brothers and Levi Strauss. And it says, it's to Mrs. Lee Yok Sui, Wong Shi, Angel Island, California. And it says, the court at my request has continued your case two weeks. And in the meantime, I trust that I can secure your landing under bond or otherwise. And of course, that was, it didn't happen for over a year later, but it says, as you say, it seems most inhumane for you to be separated from your children who need your care. I'm sorry that the immigration officials will not look at the human side of your case. However, you may rest assured that I will do all I can for you and that I'm hopeful of securing your release within the next two weeks through court action. And looking over these papers, I realized my grandmother was privileged because she was able to afford the lawyers and she did have her connections through her husband. And still, you know, she kept losing two appeals. Next. Next slide. Okay. And okay, here's what the lawyers were able to do. They, they had their PR people. They got a nice article in the newspaper, uh, San Francisco, I don't know if it was what paper it was, but it's 19, it's April 1925. And look at it, somehow this, this seems very contemporary. 
Law parts San Francisco Chinese at, from her tots. And it says, uh, the mother of six small children who are now in San Francisco is being held in, on Angel Island, the victim of technicalities of the immigration laws and subject to deportation to China. She's the wife of Li Yuxui, now dead, who was a citizen of the United States and a wealthy merchant. And, um, and it says that um, the immigration authorities claim that upon the death of Li, his wife lost her status in this country where she had lived for several years. However, Edward Hoff, Assistant Immigration Commissioner of the Port of San Francisco, has referred the matter to Washington authorities and says everything that is possible to alleviate the situation is being done. Within a month, um, my grandmother was released, within a month after this. Next. Uh, this, this is a photograph, um, well, on a document that I found um, in the National Archives, because in the 80s, um, 1980s, the, the A files were released to the National Archives, Bruno. And we were able, you know, we, whoever was interested, whoever had people who were detained on Angel Island, we could go and see if we could find their files. And I found my grandmother's file, which was so thick, like a, and at the bottom of all these papers was this picture. And you realize, you know, uh, that was the first document. And it's a, it's a, a testimony by um, uh, my grandmother's uh, father-in-law. Okay, that's my great-grandfather, Lee Wong Sang. He's signing it in English. And he says, Lee Wong Sang, you know, duly sworn, uh, that the photograph attached here is a true likeness of Wang Shi, the wife of Li Yuxui, my son, and um, she arrived on the steamer at Mongolia, 1905, holding ticket number 6364, and that, um, that she came from such and such village, that she is this person. It's um, 1905, and the signature means a great deal to me because Li Wang Sang, was a, a former railroad on the railroad worker on the Transcontinental Railroad, and um, my mother, you know, she's the one who told me, you know, he came to work on the Iron Road in 1866, and he knew how to speak English. And I go, really? And so seeing his letter, I mean, his the signature in English, was was a revelation. Okay, I have a slides. These are from my family album. Uh, this is a a picture family after the earth because my grandmother arrived she um, I guess uh, a year later she had a, a newborn baby and it was uh, a month old on the day of the, the earthquake and they fled and my grandfather this is my grandfather the in the middle wearing the, the traditional Chinese robe in the skirt Next to him is his brother in Western clothes holding a baby. My grandmother's the one um, to the left holding a baby. That's my mother. And these are her uh, two other daughters wearing white in front. And those are the her, um, other relatives and their children. But uh, my grandfather, he was uh, fleeing the earthquake in 1906. He sent his uh, um, he sent his children and wife, uh, I'm sorry, he said his wife was holding the baby with his father, Lee Wong Sang, said, you guys go, you know, I have to run back and get my papers. He went back to the, the store that was all in rubble to, to rescue his papers. And one of them was a birth certificate that showed that he was a, a citizen of the United States. So he risked his life for that. Because when he was fleeing the rubble, a soldier came by and bayoneted him. And he lay down, played dead, but he had his certificate and other papers in his, his thick, you know, me not, his thick jacket. And so it was only a flesh wound. But that's a story that I never told until the centennial of the earthquake, because I thought in those days, 
I mean, people didn't care about what happened to the Chinese and the, the exclusion law was not a, a, a big topic in our school books, it certainly wasn't. And it wasn't um, to American society, Chinese were still considered aliens and therefore their, their stories were not, struggles were not important. And what they did for civil rights was certainly not even recognized. This is a, a slide showing my grandmother a year after she's released from Angel Island and uh, she's standing with a tall priest, that's Father, uh, Father Bradley, who is one of the missionaries on Angel Island because Angel Island did have people helping. You know, they had a, a Methodist um, missionary, Catherine Marr, who was called the Angel of Angel Island, who gave comfort to the, the women. And of course, there was Donald Dino Cameron, who came to testify for many of the immigrants. And um, here's um, my, my grandmother and all her children, except for the woman on the right, that's a, a friend. So she has her six children. Those are the little boys that she was separated from. And um, my mother is the one uh, on the right, second from the right. And uh, she's the one who told me all the stories. So this was the day of their baptism. And I always wonder, why are we Catholic? Well, this, my grandmother said, if I ever get off the island, I will convert. So, <laughs> okay, let, I have a last slide. This is the celebration at Cannes Restaurant, 1953. My grandmother, it's on Mother's Day. She's celebrating a lot of things. One of them is she became a US citizen. And I, I'm on the right here. You know, with next to my mother, I sort of helped her coach, uh, help her pronounce the three branches of government. So, um, and these are my cousins. Um, there's my aunt on the left and my other aunt on the right, and my brother's right across from me. And that's my cousin next to him, and that the other girls are my cousins. So it was a, I guess this is a, the one happy picture that we have in this story. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Connie, thank you so much for sharing these stories with us and especially your really precious family photos. Um, they really bring to life, you know, the, the history not only of your family and that important narrative, but um, the images that you showed of Angel Island um, when these momentous um, ceremonies were happening and all of this recognition was finally taking place is so meaningful. So thank you so much for sharing that. My pleasure. Um, some people have been posting questions um, and we will hold them until after Jonas has a chance to make his presentation. Um, and so I wanted to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Jonas Edmund. I briefly mentioned um, earlier that he is an instructional designer for SPICE. Um, and in addition to writing curriculum, he also coordinates our National Consortium for Teaching About Asia Professional Development Seminars on East Asia for middle school teachers. And he also collaborates with the Freeman Spokely Institute for International Studies, which is sort of our umbrella organization, and other colleagues at Stanford Global Studies on a community college faculty fellowship program called the Education Partnership for Internationalizing Curriculum, or EPIC. And prior to joining SPICE in 2010, Jonas taught history and geography in Elk Grove, California, and he also taught theory of knowledge at Stockholm International School in Stockholm, Sweden. His professional interests lie in curriculum and instruction and teacher professional development with a special interest in online education development. He received his teaching credential from Sacramento State University in social science and his bachelor's degree in history from Stockholm University. And he also graduated from high school uh, from the American School in Japan. He has presented teacher seminars nationally and internationally for SPICE on a wide variety of topics and issues for K-12 educators. And today he is here to share with all of you uh, the Angel Island graphic novel and accompanying teacher's guide that he developed. Uh, to help bring this history uh, and story to life for K-12 students. So Yanis, take it away. Okay, thank you Naomi for that um, very, uh, very warm and long introduction. Uh, and also thank you Connie for your wonderful presentation and 
sharing your, uh, your personal story and the story of your grandma, um, which really brings these events to life um, and was very inspiring. So uh, I am going to share with you uh, a graphic novel that we produced at Spice. Um, it looks like this. Um, and there will be, there's a PDF version which will be available to you to use. And I hope um, if you're a teacher, you can bring it into the classroom. If you're a student, um, it can lead to further exploration. And if you're just an interested party that you will, uh, you'll find it enjoyable and interesting as well. Um, let me start by sharing uh, some slides. Let's see. Okay. And okay. Um, I hope everyone sees that. So, so Angel Island, uh, the Chinese American experience. Uh, I should say that we focused on um, the Chinese experience at Angel Island, but they, it wasn't just Chinese who passed through Angel Island. It was um, pretty much anyone who came and entered the US from the West Coast. Uh, that included Japanese, uh, Chinese, Punjabi, uh, Australians, New Zealanders, uh, people from the Philippines. Uh, so lots of people pass through uh, Angel Island. However, the Chinese experience was unique because of the Chinese Exclusion Act and uh, the numbers that pass through. Uh, I also want to mention the artist for this graphic novel, Rich Lee, who is, uh, who is amazing and who really is responsible for how good the graphic novel looks. And uh, I would encourage you to look him up if uh, you find this graphic novel um, uh, interesting. Okay, so uh, I first wanted to start with a little bit of background, um, how how that leads up to uh, Angel Island and uh, uh, the Chinese experience there. And everything I'm going to talk about now in the background is included in the teacher's guide for the graphic novel. So you'll have all of this information available to you um, as, a, as an intro or background to the story. So from 1848, or following the, following the discovery of gold in California in 1848 until an anti-Chinese immigration law was, was passed in 1882. More than 250,000 Chinese came to the United States. The majority were male sojourners who came by themselves, lured by opportunity and uh, the prospect of striking it rich in the, in the gold mines. But in reality, very few uh, stri struck it rich. Um, there, because of wage disparities, discriminatory laws, and organized acts of violence, um, their, the opportunities for Chinese were severely limited. Um, so mining profits were often elusive. Many Chinese laborers and merchants found work in other areas. Um, in addition to mining, uh, jobs in the railroad, uh, railroad construction, agriculture, manufacturing, fishing, domestic help, laundry, and goods and services. Um, and all these things attracted Chinese to the United States. In the 1870s, there was a severe economic downturn, which increased hostility towards non-white laborers, and Chinese in particular were singled out as scapegoats. In 1882, under pressure primarily from xenophobic anti-Chinese labor unions and political parties, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. With the exception of certain groups, uh, which included teachers, students, diplomats, tourists, merchants, and importantly, children of uh, Chinese with US citizenship, the act prohibited Chinese from entering the United States and precluded them from attaining US citizenship. The Chinese Exclusion Act was thus a precedent in that it never before had a specific ethnic group uh, been deemed undesirable for entry to the United States or becoming US citizens. Um, this image here, uh, it, I, you 
probably seen this in history books maybe. Um, it's quite common. Uh, you'll see that the, uh, it depicts, uh, it's, it's called The Chinese Question. It was published in 1871 by Thomas Nast. And the figure you see, the woman there is Columbia and sort of the female symbol for America. Uh, and uh, she looks angry and disgusted at this mob that's coming after um, this, uh, this, Chinese, uh, this Chinese immigrant there. Um, and although this image is interesting and uh, portrays sort of a one viewpoint, it's also, I would say, problematic in that there's a, sort of a white savior complex there and the, uh, the Chinese uh, person is portrayed as uh, weak and passive and, uh, and not advocating for himself. And that's uh, part of the narrative that we want to change um, because there is this idea that uh, Chinese immigrants or East Asian immigrants were sort of passive, silent sojourners who didn't advocate for themselves, didn't uh, fight back against unjust laws, and that's just not the case. So that's one of the things that I hope the graphic novel is able to convey. Okay. Um, in 1899, uh, let's see, oh yeah, sorry. Despite the anti-Chinese legislation, over 300,000 Chinese did come to the United States between 1882 and 1943 when the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act was finally repealed. Uh, two events in particular made this immigration possible. First in 1898, Wang Kim Ark, a US born son of Chinese immigrants, won a precedent setting Supreme Court case that upheld the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The decision entitled U.S.-born individuals to U.S. citizenship regardless of his or her ethnicity. So um, in this case, uh, in this case, uh, you have a person who was born in the United States um, of, from Chinese parents and was denied U.S. citizenship because of the, uh, the Exclusion Act fought back, took the case to court, uh, to the Supreme Court, and uh, won the case and gained U.S. citizenship. So the second thing that happened that made immigration possible for Chinese Americans during the exclusionary period was in 1906, the Great San Francisco Earthquake, um, which, among other things, destroyed City Hall uh, which housed residency and citizenship papers. With these records gone, many Chinese were able to gain U.S. citizenship falsely by claiming that they'd been born in the United States. The Supreme Court ruling, um, along with the destruction of city hall records, thus allowed a few thousand Chinese in the United States to attain U.S. citizenship and helped open a back door to immigration. As citizens, these Chinese Americans were legally able to bring over family, uh, children they had in China. And knowing that it was nearly impossible for US authorities to, uh, to prove or disprove that the people they said were their children were actually their children, um, they were able to bring over people from China who were not actually family members. So in effect, some Chinese entrants attempted to circumvent an unjust law by buying immigration slots from posing Chinese American parents with whom they had no filial relation. Um, these entrants who took on fictitious identities and family histories in coming to the United States came to be known as paper sons and paper daughters, which is what the graphic novel is about. Um, it follows the story of a paper son. Um, and entry into the, into the United States and his time at the Immigration Center. Um, before I start showing you a little bit of the graphic novel, I wanted to share some of these primary sources that the graphic novel is based on. Um, so you'll see there's, uh, there's poetry there, there's uh, interview questions, there's uh, photographs, and all of these were used um, to create the graphic novel. Um, and this, is, this can be an interesting starting off point for students. They can take a look at the graphic novel and then sort of go on a scavenger hunt and see if they can find the images. And all of these are readily available online. If they can find the images that the, uh, that the graphic novel are based on. 
Okay, um, I'm gonna quickly switch over. I'm gonna stop sharing there and switch over to the graphic novel. Let's see. And let me do this here and read mode. Okay, um, so this was produced, this graphic novel was produced in 2011. And um, sorry, I'll go back to the beginning here. Um, it, it comes with a teacher's guide. So it talks about subjects and subjects and grade levels. Uh, we say secondary, secondary school, but really, I think elementary it can be used in elementary as well and community college. I think it's, you can adapt it to most grade levels. Um, there's connections to history, suggested resources, um, essential questions. How do the experiences of Chinese immigrants to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century differ from that of other immigrant groups? Because of course, the uh, the primary um, or the, the master uh, narrative about immigration to the United States um, during this period is of Ellis Island and uh, the Statue of Liberty uh, welcoming immigrants to the United States. And this was a, a very different experience coming from um, coming uh, from the West and entering or coming entering the United States on the West Coast. Um, were Chinese immigrants justified in breaking laws to circumvent racist immigration policies? Is another question that you can, you can discuss. In the late 19th and early 20th century, was the United States a country that welcomed and offered opportunities to immigrants, or a country that disenfranchised immigrants and sought to restrict immigration? Of course, this is a trick question because it was in many ways both. Um, and finally, is the United States today a, a, today a country that welcomes and offers opportunities to immigrants or a country that disenfranchises immigrants and seeks to restrict immigration? Um, we also include objectives, uh, the materials, uh, teacher preparation and procedures for activities that you could use as you read the graphic novel. Uh, but let's skip to the actual graphic novel. So, uh, we start on the boat uh, as we're traveling across the Pacific and uh, you learn that it takes about three weeks um, and that the majority of immigrants were from the Pearl River Delta, were impoverished um, and they could only afford to travel in steerage class. And this is some uh, depictions of what it looks like inside the boat and here you'll see that there's three three different characters that we follow, or I guess four with a child. Um, one is 28, a 20, 28 year old mother and a nine year old son, and they leave China to join their husband, father in the United States. They legally attain their immigration documents. There's another person who's 39, 38 years old, who first entered the US with, a, with fraudulent identity as a merchant in 1904, but became a US citizen after the 1906 uh, earthquake. And finally, the main character that we follow is 17 years old, uh, left his village in southeastern China to try to make a better life for himself in the United States. Um, I'm not going to go through every image here, but here you can see these are notes that, uh, that the 17 year old is studying because uh, he knows that he's going to be interviewed by or interrogated once he arrives. Uh, by immigration services, and he needs to have his facts uh, align with who he says his family is or who his parents are in the United States. So there was months of planning and studying um, for, uh, for Paper Sons uh, once before they came to Angel Island to try to memorize, um, you know, the, their background, which was um, which was fictitious, of course. Um, so when ships arrived in, in San Francisco Bay, uh, they would have their documents inspected. Uh, European passengers uh, would, uh, 
usually get off immediately. They might pass through the immigration station um, just for a health check, but they were um, treated very differently. Whereas, whereas uh, um, Chinese and, and Asian uh, immigrants were often were almost always detained at immigration at, at Angel Island for different periods of time. And here you see this is the U.S. citizen here, but even as a U.S. citizen, he has trouble getting back in, which was often the case. Okay, uh, this is shows you where the immigration station was centered up here, um, and then San Francisco is down here. And interestingly, the immigration station before 1910 was, uh, was in San Francisco, and it was quite small. And really, one of the reasons why a bigger immigration center was set up was because uh, Chinese in San Francisco advocated for a bigger space, advocated, uh, um, advocated for bigger buildings, uh, because it was so cramped at these buildings here. Um, and of course, when they decided where they were going to build the immigration station, which was on Angel Island, uh, the Chinese in San Francisco and on the mainland complained that it was too far away, that it was too hard to, uh, um, uh, for them to interact with, uh, with the new immigrants coming. So different, different reasons why it was on Angel Island, the immigration station. Um, it was uh, to prevent escape, of course, just like uh, the, the possibly more famous uh, prison Alcatraz, which is just south of Angel Island. Um, it was there as quarantine. And uh, it was also there to isolate detainees from the mainland because they, the, they didn't want people they didn't want people sending, communicating, and telling, talking to uh, the the newly arrived immigrants and sharing notes about um, about what they should say when they were interrogated. And finally, it was put on this uh, on the back of this island, so it could be out of sight, so people wouldn't be able to see that there were immigrants who were being housed there for years. All right. Um, Let's see. All right, this is the arrival, um, and around 70% um, of all Chinese arriving in San Francisco between 1910 and 1940 passed through Angel Island. I've heard re recently that that number is even higher, so um, at least 70% would probably be the case. And on average, uh, um, this day would be a few weeks. Uh, but of course, as we just heard from Connie Young Yu, it could be much longer, um, oh, could be years um, that, that immigrants from China would be detained at the immigration station before, uh, before being able to leave. Let's see. And we get here and uh, women were separated from men and uh, Boys, as long you could only go with uh, children, could only go with their parents or with their mother if they were under twelve. Otherwise, they would have to go by themselves um, or to the uh, to the men's section. And when they got there, there was uh, they were shepherd, shepherded through the um, the immigration station, the entrance where they received identi identification numbers and uh, were quickly sent to the infirmary where they got tested to see, um, to see if they were carrying any diseases. And of course, this was very humiliating for a lot of, uh, for the Chinese immigrants who were not used to these kind of health checks and with, not used to being prodded and uh, stripped naked in front of other people. Some more, some more information or some more images of uh, what it looked like and what, uh, what the detainees were allowed to do. There's a really small yard. Um, and uh, other than the yard that they could go out to twice a day, they were detained and were, were confined to the barracks. Boredom was a huge issue um, at the immigration station. And as Connie Young Yu says, uh, noted, these the poems that they found really illustrate um, the lives of 
um, of, of the detainees. So here's one that reads, my belly is so full of discontent, it is really difficult to relax. I can only worry silently to myself. At times I gaze at the cloud and fog and shrouded mountain in front. It only de deepens my sadness. And there are, there are books that contain all of the poems and it's a great, um, lots of great activities that you could do using the poems on, from the walls um, in the immigration station. As I said, the, the Chinese in the United States, they, they really advocated for themselves. So uh, one way that they did that was uh, there was a strike early on because the food was considered so terrible. Um, so they, uh, they brought in chi Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese kitchen staff to make food that, would, that, would, that, the, uh, that the detainees found edible. Um, and what that led to was also that the Chinese kitchen staff was able to smuggle in notes to um, the paper sons and paper daughters. Um, so perhaps the, uh, the paper sons' parents had been interviewed about where they, where they lived or at, they'd been interviewed about you know, their background in China and, um, and then notes about this would be passed to the paper sons and uh, in the food, in the mess hall. Of course, it was not uncommon that the, uh, the guards would notice and, uh, let's see, the guards would notice that notes were being passed and so to stop, uh, stop the paper sons from getting in trouble or there would be, um, there would be small, I hesitate to call them riots, but um, there would be upheaval in the, uh, in the canteens. But here you see the paper son eating his, eating his notes um, that he'd received. And of course, a big portion, a big or a big uh, a lasting, lasting uh, negative experience for many of these detainees was the interrogations that they went through. Um, and Connie mentioned um, what kind of questions uh, were included in those interrogations. And this is, this is a depiction of what that would be like and the long hours that would be spent uh, being interrogated. Uh, and you can see the questions here. Um, and these are all based on real questions. So describe your family, how many brothers and sisters uh, you have, their names, how old they are, where they live and what they look like. What about aunts, uncles, grandparents, and great grandparents? Describe your village. How are the houses arranged? How many are in each row? Which way does the village face? Tell me about your house. How many rooms? Describe them. Who slept where? What furniture did you have? And again, I think this lends itself really well to um, activities with students, uh, where students interview each other and, and, um, and it really, it really brings home or interviews interrogate each other and try to um, to show how difficult it was uh, to be able to um, answer these questions uh, and there's some there's some more information about that and ways you can do that in the in the teacher's guide uh, let's see okay um, so I'm just gonna wrap up quickly um, a lot of times the detainees would not would uh, would not pass the interviews would get rejected um, but would appeal and ultimately most most would be able to enter the United States um, through the appeal process something like 98 percent of of uh, immigrants who arrived actually entered the United States and the appeal process is another is another example of how Chinese immigrants really advocated for themselves and were not just passive uh, silent sojourners. Uh, and here you can see also um, uh, uh, Catherine Marr, who uh, Connie Young, you mentioned, uh, who would come to the immigration station and who was a, a great support for the women at, at the immigration station and for the female de detainees. Uh, and 
organizations such as uh, the YMCA and YWCA also provided books and, um, and were supportive. Some more poems here. And then in this story, after four months, um, of course, or not of course, but um, our paper son is allowed to enter the United States. And many, many of the Chinese immigrants who entered uh, through Angel Island ended up settling in Chinatowns because of shared language and customs. Um, but Chinese Americans really settled all over the United States and um, their stories are, are incredibly diverse. And, uh, and I think that's another jumping off point for students as well to see how, how varied and diverse the Chinese American story is and the Chinese American experience. Okay, um, that's, let's see if I can stop sharing. Um, there. And so that was just a, that was a very quick run through of the graphic novel and overview of uh, um, what we base the graphic novel on. Um, some activity ideas that you can do along with the graphic novel um, include role plays, uh, developing extra scenes for the graphic novel, um, researching what the images are based on, uh, creating poems depicting the Chinese immigrant experience or developing lyrics to a song about Angel, Angel Island Immigration Station. And uh, yeah, there's, there's so much more to be done. And there's, there's other research, there's lots of great resources um, on Angel Island. And I, um, I encourage you to, um, well, hopefully be able to use this graphic novel and to be able to supplement it with, uh, with other information and other resources out there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jonas, for sharing the graphic novel resource with us and um, for guiding us through some of the essential questions in the teacher guide and kind of introducing all of us to, uh, to the guide and to the graphic novel. And as he said, I hope that this is a resource that um, all of you, especially those of you who are educators, I will be able to share with your students and use it as an entry point into um, introducing this important history um, with your students and with your communities. Um, so we are at the point now um, where we have a little less than 20 minutes um, for Q&A. And I wanna thank everyone for the wonderful questions that have been submitted. Um, we've been going through them and if you open the Q&A box, you'll see that some of them have been answered um, Dr. Gary Mukai, our director of SPICE, um, has been going through and providing some text responses to some of the questions. Um, Connie, a lot of these questions uh, that people have been submitting um, are historical in nature and um, are rather specific, so I hope you won't mind if I direct um, some of these first questions directly to you. Um, one of the first questions that came through um, was about the types of communication that the that the detainees had um, available to them. Um, what kinds of communications did they receive from lawyers or journalists um, or from government officials? Um, what types of communications did they receive? I think you could, uh, in the slides, I, I showed letters, uh, a letter that was addressed to my uh, grandmother who actually didn't read, um, couldn't read English. And it was from the lawyer. And, it, and so they received mail. They received mail, um, and they could communicate. Oh, they they could send telegrams, which cost a lot of money through lawyers. I want to mention that my grandmother's lawyer's fees were very high, and the family was very poor after she was released on Angel Island, and the daughters went to work in sweatshops uh, sewing. So uh, you know the appeals were not free. You know people really fought hard. There was a lot of sacrifice. Um, as far as communication with the, uh, between Chinese, my, my mother and her, her sisters were able to take the ferry and visit their mother at certain times. They would wait in the administration room, and there's a picture, 
the Jonas's that he had shown uh, of women. And then there's Catherine Marr and they're, they're sitting waiting. And a lot of them are waiting for visits. And the visits would only be like 10 minutes. They'd be really short. And my mother said that the guard, guards were always watching them to make sure they didn't pass anything. You know, so that communication was very bad. But my mother said she would write down things to, because there was so little time to speak to her mother. Somehow she was able to bring um, salted pork, you know, um, to her mother to eat because she could not eat food. Because at the time that she was detained, then uh, 1924, 25, they, the cooks were making, you know, American style stews that she just could not eat. And the Chinese at that time did not eat beef. So, but anyway, that was a limited communication between Chinese, of course, none uh, that was um, allowed. And then, you know, as far as US mail service and telegrams that was permitted. Thank you for responding to that. Um, I wanna go through, let's see. Um, one of the questions that came through that many people asked um, was about the number of immigrants that went through Angel Island. Um, and Gary kindly replied there that about 1 million went through between 1910 and 1940. And of these, approximately 175,000 were Chinese. Um, and then someone asked about uh, the photos that you mentioned that were first taken in the 1970s that revealed the writing on the wall in the barracks. Um, are those available digitally online? Um, and Gary kindly provided a link to the Angel Island um, AIIFF website. Um, but perhaps you know where some others might also be found online? Hmm. I don't think. Maybe in the books. Uh, the book, the Book of Poetry, you know, the poems, certainly you could, oh, I don't know if the book is online. That's by Mark Lyon, Judy Young, and Jenny Lim. I don't know if that's online, but you can order the book. Great, thank you. Um, and let's see, Gary provided a link to um, some other images on that same website. Uh, let's see. Uh, another question that came through was the percentage of Chinese detained at Angel Island and what percentage um, were deported? Um, and Gary noted that between 75 to 82 percent of the immigrants successfully made it through the immigration station um, and that he guesses that most of those who were deported um, were Chinese due to the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, but we were wondering if you had anything to add to that. I don't have any statistics now. Oh, I did want to mention that my grandmother came through Angel Island in the year that was the most challenging. It was 1924 when the law was enacted that said, hereafter no alien ineligible for citizenship shall be allowed to the United States. And that law was actually aimed at uh, stopping picture brides and Japanese coming in. And of course, my grandmother was also an alien ineligible for citizenship, so right away, you know, and being a widow. So, but it's, it's good to know how the, the wording of the law was after the exclusion law. After the exclusion law of the Chinese exclusion law, all the law said, hereafter, no alien ineligible for citizenship. And that phrase was used for the alien land laws too, ineligible for citizenship. Thank you. Let's see, there's a question here about how was it legal to force someone um, to go through Angel Island, even if they were American citizens? Honus, did you answer that? Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, I don't know uh, if it was legal, uh, but uh, I mean, one, one thing was for health reasons, uh, communicable diseases. Um, so the immigration station was used to make sure that people were healthy. Um, but there was also um, a lot of suspicion due to the, due to people bringing, due to the paper sons um, phenomenon, the, uh, there was a lot of suspicion um, when it came to, when it came to documents. So even if you had the correct documents, 
um, you were sometimes forced to go to, the, to Angel Island anyway. Thank you, Yanis. Um, let's see, I'm trying to go through these questions here. There are, have been so many wonderful questions uh, submitted. Uh, let's see. I apologize, some of these questions are rather long here. <laughs> We have also had quite a few people sharing um, fantastic resources. Um, Felicia Lowe, who I'm, I'm sure you know, Connie, um, she has offered to share some resources with us um, that we'll include in an email that will go out to everyone, to all of the attendees tomorrow. Um, so we'll be sending out an email tomorrow to everyone uh, with a list of recommended resources, um, as well as the information about how to, the link and then the code to download the graphic novel from the SPICE website. Um, there was an, a good question here about um, children who are 12 years of age. So if a child was 12 years of age, um, would they be considered adults and treated like adults? Yes. Yes. Yes, they would. They would be uh, sent to the men's, to the men's quarters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and also by the 1970s, were there any guards or quarantine staff still alive whose experiences might have been captured in oral histories? And what is left of their side of, of this part of the story? Yes, I, I think there were. The people that I interviewed were, were Chinese interpreters. And I interviewed the immigrant, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the commissioner of immigration for San Francisco. I interviewed his, his widow. And she, gave me photographs of the, um, actually one of the iconic photographs of her husband, um, Edward Cahill, standing on the steps with, with the, the um, you know, a lot of the Chinese immigrants, that, that photograph and pictures of the, the, the administration building with the wharf, which was burned down. So that was really important. So in the 70s, she gave it to me in 1972. And then she said that she went on many trips with her husband and she said he knew that it was a very harsh law, that, but he had to uphold the law. That's what she said. And, uh, and then she gave me a comic book that was, or a graphic novel. It was one of these mystery magazines that was published with his picture on the front of it saying, you know, he's fighting crime, you know, <laughs> uh, the illegal immigration. So, you know, I, I sort of got a feeling of, of what it would be like to be an official having to hold, uphold the, um, the law. Interpreters themselves, they were in a, a, a difficult position because, you know, being Chinese Americans and they knew some of the, I mean, they, you couldn't help but know some of the people or know their relatives. And to have to, to stand there and interpret and just, and, and, um, and be a witness. Now, the interesting thing is, in the Board of Inquiry, this is what one of the interpreters told me, William Jung. Um, he said, you know, there are two people, three people on the board. There's a stenographer, and then there's, t there's the interrogator and the assistant interrogator. The stenographer gets a vote. And he, she, he goes, what is that, you know, you know, what does she know? Why, why would she have to get a vote on, on somebody being deported or not deported? So he, he would see the injustice of it. And he said, at the very end of the interview, he just said, you know, all this was so unnecessary. This is so unnecessary. And when I told him about the, our committee to save the barracks, he said, why do you want to do that for? He said it was just so miserable. He was thinking in those terms, not in terms of the poetry. The poetry to me, that was a witness. That is our witness. If, if the building were not saved and the, 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 the poetry was destroyed, there'd be no evidence that, of the Chinese feeling that all stories are always never told from the, the, the Asian's point of view. This is one situation where the Chinese told their own stories, how they felt and what they went through. Thank you for sharing that and for underscoring the importance of the preservation of that, that history. 
Um, there was a question here. Um, let's see. Oh. Can birthright citizenship be overturned by another branch of government going forward? What are you talking about now? <laughs> there was an attempt. There certainly has been an attempt, right, Honus, you know, <laughs> by the, the Trump administration challenging that, you know, for the... Yeah, certainly Trump has brought it up. I... Certainly brought it up, yeah. But, the, but you mentioned Wong Kim Ark and the, the famous case. If it, you see, the thing about uh, these, it's important to remember someone like that, Wong Kim Ark, and the, the, the case for civil rights, because what he established was birthright citizenship, not just for Chinese, but ever after, for all peoples. And uh, the, for my grandmother's case, the fact that she was cured of this, this supposed, you know, this, this, is considered, you know, so dangerous, you know, the fact that she was cured, it set a precedent for other, you know, other uh, immigrants who had the same situation. They, they used the case of, you know, Mrs. Lee Yuk Sui, you know, she was able to land and she had this, um, uh, her, you know, affliction occurred. And so, so this was a, I mean, it's surprising to me. I learned this much, much later. I thought of my popo you know, fighting for civil rights. <laughs> and uh, it's very inspiring to me that, that something, some change did occur that was positive after all this ordeal. Thank you. Um, I've noticed that um, there are a few people in the, uh, who have been commenting in the Q&A um, from Angel Island State Park. Casey, um, so thank you for your contributions to responding to some of the questions there about preservation of historical sites on Angel Island. Um, it's really wonderful to, to have you here. Um, and Casey noted that, or Edward noted, um, that the Tiburon Ferry to Angel Island is operating, um, although the, uh, the buildings on the island are currently closed due to COVID-19. Um, but if those of you who have not yet had a chance to visit uh, the island, um, there is a ferry that's operating. Um, so there, there is an opportunity to go and visit. Um, and I also asked uh, Edward if he wouldn't mind saying a few words because he had mentioned, um, let me see if I can find your exact uh, comment here, um, that there are plans to, uh, to open, um, and I cannot find your comment here, of course, now that I need it, uh, there are plans <laughs> to open uh, the the former hospital site uh, on Angel Island uh, next year. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that with us. Sure. Thanks for that opportunity, mate. But we're just first, thank you, Connie, for continuing to share your story and the story of how this important part of U.S. history has been preserved. And as y'all heard on today's call, there are so many ways that this history remains relevant today. And to Jonas and Rich, the graphic novel is beautiful. And I hope that all of y'all listening on today's call have the opportunity to, to leverage this amazing resource that's been created. Uh, I asked Naomi just to be able to quickly share that at the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, we're one of the primary nonprofit partners that works with Angel Island State Park and, and shout out to Casey who's celebrating her 20th year anniversary there. We've worked to develop a curriculum guide for, for teachers as well and you can access that for free, download it online at www dot a i i s f dot org backslash curriculum and we're really excited to share with all of you that there is a building, the former Public Health Services Hospital building, which has never been open to the public before, but it is being, it's been restored after a, a multi-year, multi-million dollar process through private and public donations that will be opening hopefully later this fall as the Angel Island Immigration Museum. And that museum will house three key exhibits, at least to start with, one exhibit that focuses on exclusionary immigration Immigration policies, one that focuses on how that building was used to quarantine and treat immigrants trying to come to the U.S. during the period that Angel Island was open, and then a final exhibit that focuses on the contributions of immigrants, both those who came through Angel Island as those who came afterwards. So thanks, Naomi, for the opportunity to, to plug that. Uh, if you want more information about the new Angel Island Immigration Museum, you can visit www.aiisf.org backslash A-I-I-M. Thanks so much.
Great. Thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing that. Um, I cannot wait to go visit this new site and to see the museum um, for myself. So thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you do um, in preserving this history as well, all of you over at uh, Angel Island um, at the station right now. So thank you so much. Um, we have time for maybe one more question here. Um, there was a question that came in. Um, let's see. With rising anti-Chinese sentiment growing in the US uh, because of the pandemic um, and because of the trade war, do you see any significant similarities to anti-Chinese politics now and the anti-Chinese demagoguery that preceded the Chinese exclusion law? Well, there certainly is a similarity as far as the anti-Chinese feeling. And it's a, the whole, um, you know, it's, it's, sort of inflamed by the administration that the, the Chinese spread the virus, that they're, um, they're taking our jobs away, um, they're um, you know, using unfair trade practices, all these negative things that they were used in the past. And, um, and it, it trickles down to daily life for people, you know, uh, today. There's a lot of uh, tension in this society and, and uh, there have been numerous incidents of people taking it out on Asians, just saying, you know, you're the ones who cause all this. And so again, it's a scapegoating. Um. Thank you for sharing that. Jonas, did you have anything to add? No, I, I mean, I, I agree with Connie. It's, uh, you, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's scapegoating. It might take uh, the exact details of it might be different, but um, you know, in many ways, it's it's quite similar. But I also yes, I'd like to add that it goes. The roots of xenophobia and nativism are so deep in our society. It just, of course, you know, beginning with slavery and and the and then uh, the next would be the immigration of hordes of Chinese coming to work on the railroads and, um, you know, taking jobs away from other people after the railroads were done. And, and the whole idea of, uh, of Chinese being a threat to American society, which was institutionalized by the Chinese exclusion law. And it goes back to that. That's why it's so important that we study it to understand it, to understand this history, that it's so deep and that it was when we talk about the legalities of Chinese coming in, you know, um, illegally uh, on false papers, the, the unconstitutionality of the Chinese exclusion law is, is just major. It's, it's central to, to our discussion about American society. Thank you so much, Connie. And I think that's a perfect note for us to end on. Um, I think that we are all here today because we understand um, and we believe that this is important history for us to all know uh, and to continue to share uh, with our students and with others in our communities. And so um, we hope that through this webinar, we have taken part um, in helping to sort of provide uh, more understanding, more education about this history and that we can continue um, to spread the word about its importance um, through our communities and through the years. So I wanna thank so much um, our speakers today, Connie Young Yu, thank you for sharing your family stories, your personal photos, uh, your uh, expertise with us today. And um, we truly appreciate it. Um, Jonas, thank you for sharing the graphic novel and your pedagogical expertise with us. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank Sabrina Ishimatsu who coordinated all of the logistics for today's webinar. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, and to Gary Mukai, uh, SPICE Director, for your guidance and leadership as always. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending out an email tomorrow, which will include several recommended resources from Connie, as well as some links um, to other recommended resources as well, um, such as those shared by Edward today and um, by Felicia Lowe, um, who's sending me some great resources to share as well. And uh, we will also be sharing the code, which you should see now in the chat, um, a link di directly to the graphic novel in the SPICE online store. Um, and if you include that discount code, um, which expires in one week, um, so please be sure to download it um, before the week is up, 
if you are interested in getting that resource. Um, so thank you, everyone. I apologize for taking us a little bit over our time, um, but I hope that you found this to be um, a helpful uh, hour and a half, um, helpful resource for all of you, and we really thank you for joining us today. Please take care. Thank you. <laughs>